There's a passage in the canon where the Buddha is explaining the different aggregates, and he gives examples for each. And the examples for perception and consciousness are very similar. In terms of perception, you recognize what you see blue, red, yellow, whatever. Whereas with consciousness, you recognize what you taste sweet, sour, bitter. That's not the case that perception happens only at the eye and consciousness only at the tongue. I think the point he's getting at is that just as your sense of vision is a more active sense than your sense of taste, in the same way perception is more active than consciousness, I mean, both of them are active. There's an element of intention in each. But consciousness is what basically receives sensory input, and then perception is what creates a world out of it, focuses on what's important, puts aside what's not. All the mind's activities in terms of recognizing a figure against a ground. That's all the activity of perception. You would think about the difference between sight and taste. With sight, it's not just a matter of registering visual imprints. You basically create a three-dimensional world out of what you see. They tell of people who have been blind from birth who undergo an operation that gives them sight, and they find it very confusing because their brains haven't learned how to handle all that input. Many of them end up putting on dark glasses so they don't have to bother with it. It's a really a learned function of the mind, something you have to develop. And in the same way when you meditate, perception is something you really have to develop. Consciousness is pretty much there, just a matter of directing it to the sense of the body. But then what you perceive makes all the difference. The first thing you want to learn how to perceive is the sensation of the breath, learning how to recognize which of the properties of the body, which of the sensations in the body correspond to the breath. And for people who've grown up in a culture where they're taught about breath energy throughout the body, it's a lot easier because they've learned how to recognize different sensations as breath sensations in the body. And for those of us who haven't, it's a learned it's a learned skill, but it's something you can develop. Sensitizing yourself to the sense of motion around the body. Now you have two kinds of motion. There's the motion of the, the blood through your blood vessels, and then there's the motion of the breath. And they're two different things. Because the blood pushes up against the, the earth of the vessels. And so there's a sense of blockage sometimes, or a sense of running up against something, whereas breath really is very free-flowing. And you want to develop that perception in mind, that concept. It might be a mental image or just something you tell yourself. Breath can flow anywhere, through anything. And then look for the sensations that correspond to that. They're there. It may take you a while to get sensitive to them, but the time spent in learning how to develop this perception is time well spent. And then you can work on perceiving the other elements. Fire would be the warmth. You can think of water as being cool, earth as being heavy, solid. Then there's space, and then there's the awareness of all these things. These are all elements, they're all dhatu, and they're a useful set of perceptions to have. When you're feeling lightheaded, you can focus on 
the heavy sensations in the body, to bring things into balance. When you're feeling warm or cold, you can focus on whichever element is going to bring things back into balance. But earth can also get really heavy and oppressive. And water and fire can also get out of control. Sometimes when you have a fever, you might want to think of getting things cool and you actually make it worse. So you have to be very careful in how you focus on these. The breath is the one that's most useful. This is why the Buddha has you focus on breathing. One of the reasons he has you focus on breathing. Also, the various elements, it's the one most responsive to the image you hold in your mind. And also, it's a good mirror for the mind itself. But this practice and perception is useful, both for the sake of getting your mind into concentration and also for dealing with other issues as you go through life. You get more and more sensitive to the role that how you process things determines how you experience things. You see someone who looks attractive, and the mind immediately slaps certain perceptions on that person. It all happens so quickly, and it all seems so natural that you think, well, that's the way that person is. The person's attractive. And you forget the extent to which you've learned your ideas about what's attractive. And you forget the extent to which when you're applying those ideas, you're ignoring a lot of other things that are going on, both in your own mind and also in what's actually there, the object that you're viewing as attractive. This is why we have the contemplation of the body into 32 parts, to provide you with an alternative set of perceptions. Dividing the body up into hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, and all the way down through the, the internal organs and the internal fluids. And you can ask yourself, which of them is really attractive? If you took them off and put them in piles on the floor, you'd be hard put to say that any of them were. And yet when you put them together in a certain way, then suddenly the mind slaps these perceptions on them. You want to learn to see how arbitrary that is. The same when you're angry. A person does something and immediately you focus on how outrageous it was. You have certain standards that you apply to these things. And again, it's, a lot of this is in your perceptions. I remember when I was in Thailand, I'd be sitting with a group of people and someone co would come in and make a few comments and then leave. And the people were really upset. They said, didn't you notice there was no, there were no, there was no tail to his voice, as they said. Because in Thailand you soften your sentences or you make them harder, depending on these little particles that you put at the end of the sentence. And this person had no particles at all. There was no tail to his voice. It got them all worked up. And it all gone right past me. This is one of the reasons why going to another country is useful to learn to see how arbitrary your perceptions can be. Most people go over and they see how arbitrary the foreigner's perceptions are. But if you really want to learn from going abroad, you have to learn to turn around and look at yourself and realize how. Well, Things that I learned from my own culture were pretty arbitrary, too. It helps loosen up that way in which we apply perceptions and helps make you more sensitive to how your perceptions really do shape the way you experience things. And if you find that you're shaping them in a way that's causing stress or suffering, you could shape them in another way. You could apply other perceptions. The trick is learning how to make them stick. This is one of the reasons why we practice concentration. You're holding a perception of mind, the perception of breath, and you're learning to make it stick. And you can do the same with the other elements. Space is fun. 
because it is literally the most spacious of the perceptions you can have, this sense of openness, a flow of being unobstructed, and the hard boundaries of your body break down. Everything seems permeable. I've actually talked to Dharma teachers who think that that's a taste of awakening or actually the experience of awakening, but it's just a perception. It's a perception of space. And if you can learn to hold it in mind, it requires good, strong powers of concentration. This is why it's developed after you've worked with the more blatant elements like breath, fire, water, earth. There's your ability to hold a particular perception in mind. And this is how mindfulness is related to perception. You apply the perception, then you keep remembering it. Whatever comes up in the body is breath, 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 breath. And you learn to see it from the point of view of it's being breath, or breath being the, the thread that ties everything together. Once you build up the powers of mindfulness to keep that in mind, then you can go to more subtle perceptions like space. But you still have to see that they are perceptions. It's a kind of karma. And so what we're learning how to do is take this karma of perception, which so often we use in unskillful ways, and turn it into the, what the Buddha called the fourth kind of karma, the karma that leads to the end of karma. Make it part of the path to unravel the ways in which you create suffering. And learn how to free yourself from all the perceptions that you've picked up from your background, from your family, from your friends, from whatever, and see that there is an element of choice. And once you develop that power of keeping a perception in mind, making it stick, then you can get better and better applying the three perceptions of inconstancy, stress, and not-self. Just hold these perceptions in mind. And again, the, these can lead to states of concentration. As the Buddha said, the perception of not-self can take you to the dimension of nothingness, which may be why some people think that perception of not-self is automatically insight and automatically leads to something beyond concentration. But the Buddha does note that it can, if you don't develop it with further insight into what's going on, just holding the perception in mind can lead you to a sense of what they call the dimension of nothingness, what some people interpret as an experience of no self. But it's just the dimension of nothingness, a state of concentration or a perception attainment. The trick there is, after you've learned how to hold that perception in mind, you want to turn around and look at what is this process of making perceptions, applying perceptions, shaping your experience through perceptions. That's where the real insight comes. When you begin to see that a particular perception has its advantages but also has its drawbacks. And ultimately you get tired of the whole issue of shaping things through your perceptions. That's when a sense of disenchantment, dispassion arises. But before you're really going to understand this process of perception, you have to learn how to master it, see that it really is a type of karma. And then you do have the choice of developing certain perceptions or other perceptions. Some of them you've developed willy-nilly without really thinking you were developing them. In the same way as when we open our eyes and we see a three-dimensional world, we forget how much ac activity went into that skill. So in the practice of concentration, we're trying to remind ourselves, well, this is what's happening. This is an action. This is a choice each time you apply your perception.
and puts you in a better position to understand the whole process, both in concentration and when you're dealing with issues that arise in the course of your encounters with other people, events that happen around you. You want to get better and better at learning how to apply the skillful perception, the appropriate perception. that leads to true welfare and happiness. So this is the karma we're working on right now. It could be just what they call bright karma that keeps us spinning around nicely in the process of wandering on. But if we learn how to apply it really skillfully with all the elements of the path, right view through right concentration, then it becomes the karma that leads to the end of karma, perceptions that lead to the end of perceptions. That's one of the skills the Buddha wants us to develop.